Hello, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. I'm speaking to you today from Waterloo, Canada, where I am the founding director of the Waterloo Institute for Social Innovation and Resilience. And I've been invited to speak to you today about paradox and paradox and social innovation. Uh, is, a, is a fascinating topic and there are so many different angles that we could take on it. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you. I hope I can do that. Um, this is always a little tricky, but let's see what we've got here. Yeah, so paradox in research and action in social innovation. It's really what we're about here at University of Waterloo. We're both interested in studying it, but also in devising ways to help practitioners to get you know, better at it and to develop methods for doing that. So first, of course, and I think you're probably getting this with every talk, but it's useful to share it again because it, <laughs> it's a slippery concept. And I actually think that the definition of paradox changes and, and what we have to say about it changes a little bit. So this is from the Oxford English Dictionary which defines paradox as a situation, person, or thing that combines contradictory features or qualities, features of qualities, such as the mingling of deciduous trees with elements of desert flora forms a fascinating ecological paradox. And secondly, a statement or proposition that despite sounding sound reasoning from acceptable premises leads to a conclusion that seems senseless logically unacceptable or self-contradictory. So from the beginning of our work in social innovation, we were struck by the importance of paradox in the practice of social innovation. It seemed that the kind of intractable problems that most social innovators were interested in addressing were hooked on a, to a kind of enduring contradiction, not initially, perhaps. Initially, the challenge for most social innovators presents itself as a single pure goal. How can we save endangered species? How can we reduce homelessness? How can we support the rights and cultures of indigenous peoples? How can we reduce youth violence in inner cities? How can we preserve nature? So these questions appear simple at first and frankly, I doubt if any of us would have the energy to embark on real social innovation if they didn't have that kind of initial simplicity. But part of the problem was that for most people embarking on this kind of endeavor, we see the problem is out there. It's created and perpetrated by others who need to be confronted and perhaps constrained or at least changed. Now, those others might not have a face, it might be the system, but it's, but it's out there. Problems out there, we are the solution or we would like to be the solution. However, the minute a program or approach or initiative is launched, the paradoxes start to accumulate. How do we save endangered species in protected areas where communities at their borders are starving or are near refuge? How can we reduce homelessness while maintaining our right to private property? How can we support the rights and cultures of indigenous peoples without giving back their land? How can we reduce youth violence without making ourselves vulnerable? How do we preserve nature while maintaining the economy and the tax base that allows us to establish and maintain protected areas? While these paradoxes are ignored at the peril of innovators, they can be paralyzing. Moreover, they accumulate through time and through experimentation. Our challenge as both educators and researchers was to try to understand and continue to be to try to understand how and why, why this accumulation occurs and also to provide tools for practitioners to deal with these paradoxes. This is not easy, but is aided by an understanding of the fact that addressing paradox also provides new possibilities for moving an innovation forward. As Charles Hamden Turner pointed out, and was, we'll deal with a little more fully later on in this talk, the space defined by what he called the horns of dilemma or the two sides of any paradox is a highly generative and creative space. His work builds on age old insights of philosophers and social scientists such as Hegel, who argued for the power of dialectics, thesis, antithesis and synthesis, 
and structural sociologists such as Claude Levi-Strauss, who argued that all the great myth mythologies of human cultures were provoked by enduring paradoxes, which he called oppositions, which the myths themselves found ways to reconcile. So, so essentially his argument is that paradox in itself is an engine for creativity in most human cultures. So in our research and in trying to understand paradox and address it both in research and in practice, uh, we felt we had to take two different tacks at different points in time. The first were synchronic studies, which, and, which means that we looked at what associates with what, how parts interact in a social innovation at any given time. But then we also need to look at diachronic studies, which were the patterns over time, causal or and or emergent, and how these how things change over time through watching these patterns. Both these types of approaches uh, brought to light interesting aspects of paradox, and both offered promising ways to engage practitioners in, in dealing generatively with these kinds of paradoxes. So first let's look at the synchronic research. So interviews with multiple social entrepreneurs was the way we approach looking at social innovation in real time. Social entrepreneurs, social innovators, system innovators engaged in, in all kinds of efforts to address intractable problems. And you know, one of the things that we discovered was that paradoxes were part, of, were an emergent phenomena that tended to be created by the action itself. So over in the left here, you have a picture of a homeless person. Um, one of the initiatives that we dealt with was um, the, in New York, the National Initiative on Homelessness. And we, we, were, we met with a group, an amazing group who, who were outlining the strategies they'd taken to try to address this homeless problem in New York, which was quite severe at the time. And they just said that they decided to embark on a strategy of trying to get the young homeless males off the street first, partially because they hadn't been there that long. Uh, they were quite motivated to work and they felt if they could, they could place them most e easily and, and find them shelter. So they began to do this through a variety of programs and we're having you know, quite measurable success. And just about the time they were about to break out the champagne and say, you know, we've really made a, a difference to this problem. Someone noticed that the violence against street women had gone up exponentially. Now, who would have known this? Who would have known that the presence of young street men uh, in fact, it's the deterrent to violence against street women. But of course it re revealed a, a, a paradox in itself because it's clear that if that's the case, the homeless were not individuals without location, which is the way we tend to represent them. Rather, they were communities. And what did that actually mean about what it meant to have a home? And you know, how we should go about addressing it. So in complex systems, you often have to poke them and get a re reaction before you know what the next step is. But in poking the system and getting reaction, you often discover increasingly deeper layers which reveal paradoxes and tensions that you never knew existed before you began to act in certain kinds of ways. Um, so, you know, that was just a snapshot in time, a, a certain moment in time where you could see the innovators themselves struggling to try to solve a problem. And in the process of doing it and acting it out, surfacing whole new issues that also often, if you remember our definition of paradox, seems kind of senseless, not to, to add up, to be contradictory, to simply not make sense. And to make sense of it, they need to push further to find some way to connect these kinds of data points. So one of the things was through this kind of emergent paradoxes. Another um, was what we have often called the forced identification with the other. And this was a one case I can just give you an example of that was an effort in Boston um, in the, the late 90s to, to it was called the Boston Miracle to address the, the challenge of youth violence 
in, in Boston. There was gang violence and there was a spiraling number of, of murders in these inner city communities. And is this man pictured here, Reverend Jeff Brown, uh, was a minister in that community. But as he said himself, you know, he came and he preached and he, he, con he consoled his parishioners and then he would get in his nice car and he would drive off somewhere else. Um, and he saw the gangs as the problem. It was out there. And he and the other ministers decided that in order to address this, you know, they really had to do something. It was getting, it was really getting out of control. Um, so they began by going as a group and walking in the streets at night. The streets were dark and abandoned with only these gangs there. It was quite frightening uh, because the gangs were seen as the problem. They were seen as the other. But over months of doing this, as um, Reverend Brown began to get to know some of the gang members, he discovered to, to his astonishment that they weren't so different from him. That the things that they longed for and that they wanted were very similar to things that he wanted and tried to attain. And that some of their anger and rage was something he shared. So he discovered that the enemy essentially was inside himself. And when he had that realization, he, he, it was a breakthrough. He and the other ministers began to make, be able to make real progress and there was a measurable drop in the youth murders. So, but th this is a, a great example of one of the enduring paradoxes of social innovation, which is also you know, a paradox of complexity and quantum theory. The observer is both outside and inside the system that they are trying to address. And this often means that the innovator has to change his own perspective and often himself before he can have a, any, he or she can have any kind of catalytic impact on the system itself. So, you know, the, the, the notion of, of um, having to own the problem as well as address the problem is something which is quite challenging for many innovators. Um, and for me, one of the really enduring paradoxes of social innovation. So from that work, we again moved to saying, well, what should, how can we do this in practice? And we were struck by that insight of, of Jeff Brown's and many other, many other innovators said the similar kind of thing. And I was reminded of a, this poem by W.B. Yeats, um, which is just a stanza from this poem where he says, great hatred, little room, main be from the start, I carried from my mother's womb a fanatic's heart. Um, and what he meant by that was that he, you know, he, he was born angry, angry at the situation in Ireland, angry at the overlords, et cetera. But what's interesting, because he's such a wordsmith, is that he uses this notion of being maimed, that in fact, this anger itself, it didn't actually empower him, it kind of maimed him. And, you know, what did he mean by that? Well, we can get it, some insight into that when we look at, the notion of ne the nemesis and the notion, the Jungian notion of the shadow. So in the, the shadow is a concept that was devised by the psychologist C.G. Jung, and who argued that the parts of ourself that we repress and edit out and reject um, means that we forget we, that we are a full human being with all the capabilities of any human being we tend to forget we have what we have labeled bad qualities because we've actually forgotten. And from the Greek point of view, the whole idea of nemesis is that we lose a sense of proportion. We see ourselves as good and not as having bad qualities. We see the problem is out there and not in ourselves. And when we see other people or other situations that are exhibiting the, the elements that we don't allow ourselves, we see red. We react with very exaggerated, almost fanatic emotion to that person. And you can probably all think of someone who just grates on you in that kind of way. So this reaction blinds us or maims us. As we have difficulty acting with integrity, we don't act out of our full self, our full human nature. We react out of, out of that part of ourselves that is defending um, ourself and, and which tends to deepen or make the problem worse. So the Greeks felt strongly um, that ultimately and inevitably, if not reclaimed or owned, that we in fact also 
shared in those qualities that are making us see red in other people, we would meet our nemesis and it would defeat us. So a lack of balance or proportion would not go unpunished in that sense. So, you know, we've devised some um, exercises and I'm not gonna do them here, we don't have time, but I will send along um, uh, a little uh, book of practices that we developed. And this exercise is one of them, a very simple exercise. It takes almost no time at all. Uh, and it's highly personal, highly reflective, but it, it has a capacity to reveal the fact that, you know, that, we, the things that really bother us that we, that we want to attack out there are in fact the opposite of what we hold to be our own ideal self. And furthermore, when we think about each of those qualities from the point of view of a human attribute, we can usually find a way in which that, the, that particular attribute could be very helpful at certain times in certain kinds of situations. And because we have edited out of our being, so to speak, um, it has maimed us. We can't always respond in a way that's really constructive. And, and I do think that this tends to happen um, in many situations of social innovation where uh, there's justifiable anger and rage among the people who are organizing to try to overcome it. But in fact, if, if it's impossible to move beyond that, to recognize the wholeness of the connection, even with the thing that we're attacking, it's oddly hard to generate real solutions. So when you try to apply this to broadisms, because that's very personal and reflective, but, but kind of useful as it was with Jeff Brown to recognize that the enemy was us as Pogo would say, <laughs> we've met the enemy and it's us. Um, but, Charles Hamden Turtle, who I mentioned before, uh, developed a very interesting framework for looking at paradox and innovation. I mean, he was working in the private sector, but it, it is very easy to connect this with the social sector as well. So Charles Hamden Turtle knows that most industries are structured around opposing dilemmas, not just one, there may be up to around 16, but he developed a methodology for eliciting the dilemmas and paradoxes with particular attention to those that were those embedded in metaphors. And he discovered there was a high consensus among executives across a particular industry about which, which at horn of the dilemma any individual firm had selected tend to be located. And he also said that, you know, value adding, and this was measurable uh, value added, um, any innovation that really added value in a measurable way was associated with a reconciliation of the paradox or the horns of the dilemma, much like Larry Strauss notion of good myth methodology. So here's a case. He, he looked, did look at the car industry and he talked about, so these two axes are like the two horns and we could turn them around, look at them like horns. Um, but one of them is, you know, how, power, how, how environmentally friendly is a car? What kind of low emissions do you have? or how powerful is a car. And this is seen as for, for a very long time as a dilemma in the automobile industry. So you could go to making environmentally friendly or powerful cars, but you couldn't really reconcile the two. And, and in fact, you know, car makers tended to locate themselves at sort of at one end of this continuum or another. And you could, he went to all car makers that could place the, the different companies within that square about you know, how close they were to to, to which end of, of the, which one of the dilemma. So the question is, you know, has anybody tried to reconcile the two? And of course, you know, they have attempts, this was the Volkswagen sports car that was supposed to have zero emissions and be very powerful at the same time. And then there was a scandal revealing, in fact, that the measurements about emissions had been faulty and it, it wasn't uh, as successful um, or as good at this job as it people had hoped it would be. But but, and, and the company, you know, had lied about it, had to retract it. But the thing is that, you know, it's not simple to innovate. It's not simple to bring together these values that seem somewhat paradoxical. You know, going back to some of those cases I mentioned before about, you know, how do you feed the hungry masses at the, at the borders of a protected area and keep an endangered species alive? You know, depending on whether you're a social worker or whether you're a conservation biologist, you're going to be prone to see the problem very differently. But if you're going to come to an innovation that's really going to be sustainable, 
you're going to need to find a way to reconcile those points of the dilemma. So you, when, you, when you look at, I'm just gonna give you a few examples of, of this in the, in the social situation, the social dilemma. You think about the whole notion of nature versus culture or environment versus you know, human man. And so you've got, you know, you've got on the one end, the built environment with economic growth, which allows for a lot of social services and the other, you have ecosystem services, natural environment conservation. This kinds of debates go on around innovation in cities all the time. The lifestyle, you know, you, how do you build communities? You have this cosmopolitan diversity, accessible, walkable, urban, one image of the ideal. The other is the suburban, uh, lots of space, easy commute, big roads and highways, lots of privacy, two very, very different images. And they're, they're really paradoxical. They're in conflict with each other. But if you want to think about how you design a sustainable uh, city, you're going to have to deal with those two sets of values that seem quite contradictory, similar political philosophies, political legal organizations. So, you know, for example, one of the things that you might consider doing if you were thinking of this nature versus culture, you think of economic growth versus ecosystem services, a, a big debate in many of the fields that I work in. So, you know, you are, there are efforts and innovations that can be placed as an attempt to reconcile these, you know, retrofitting buildings, you know, using old cars or, you know, derelict junk, orphan, orphan trash to make, in fact, uh, different kinds of gardens. Um, so, you know, the, the effort and innovation that, that works and that sticks is often that which finds some way to reconcile those two. And, but again, you know, that, that isn't very easy. So those, those are tools that we can use. And when we try to work with, um, uh, you know, someone who's trying to innovate in any particular sector, you know, you can, framing it as that your values are less added than reconcile because you know, the values resist and oppose each other. Um, and we can choose between opposing values. We go to one end with continuing with the other. And that's always the tendency. Whatever is the current status quo is bad. We're going to do the opposite. Um, but much more value and much more sustainable innovation is created through these kinds of combinations. Um, and so that reconciling capacity is a form of integrity, of, of harmony, of novelty, both inside the self, but also outside in the world. And that harmony of integration can do no better than the harmony and the mutuality of those who create it. So again, I just want to underline this isn't easy and, and it's, it's a real struggle, but it often represents um, a kind of leap forward uh, for the innovators that we work with. Because once they're able to conceive it that way, they suddenly get a whole new cascade of ideas about how to go about realizing their ultimate goal or their ultimate purpose. So now let's move to the, the issue of diachronic. Um, so we felt that while it was great to try to understand paradox and other features of social innovation in a synchronic way, because we could actually work with present day innovators who were trying to, to create innovation, it was really pretty hard to tell which one of those in its beginning form was going to have a lasting impact. And we felt the need to look much more historically in order to enrich and develop our own understanding of paradox and a number of other elements. So we started on a project with, which had to do with conducting historical casework. And there'll be you know, a couple of practices that came out of this that we can use to help people to understand history in their own context. I should just step back and say quickly that you know, our definition, our working definition of social innovation is squarely focused on systems, complex systems. So we consider it any project, product, process, program, platform, any other P that you have to think of that challenges and over time changes the defining routines, resource and authority flows or beliefs of a broader social system in which it is introduced. So it's like we're trying to change the system dynamics that created the problem in the first place. And we're looking for things that through that process of doing it, ensure their own uh, durability scale and, and ultimate transformative impact. So we, we embarked on a, on a history project, a history of social innovation, um, 
partly because we said, well, how do we know any of these ones we're seeing are going to have that durability? We can only tell that in retrospect. And so, you know, the need for more data pushes us to think, well, could we, could we take a much longer perspective to understand these dynamics, including that of paradox? And, you know, there were others like the drift socio-technical transitions work, which was building on historical studies. We wanted to take it further. But we were also interested in building on the work of Brian Arthur and, and uh, Johns, Peter Johnson, um, looking at, in fact, um, that innovation was a result of a, of a phenomenon of a breakthrough of some kind. Now, in Arthur's case, it was natural or scientific. Um, and we added the notion that there could also be new ideas, social facts, philosophies, et cetera, in the social realm. And that looking at it from a complexity theory point of view, over time, it was a combination of emergence and, and bricolage of bringing together elements. And there were a number of different kinds of actors and transitions, et cetera. And the, the concept of what they call in complexity theory, the adjacent possible, the, the other things going on parallel, which can become a source of material ideas, inspiration, um, when combined with, with the original set of, of ideas. So we looked for cases that were clear successes in terms of institutional impacts, not always with positive impacts. We wanted to look at a few that had gone wrong as well. And, and, um, and we were glad we did, because we got a lot of insights partly about this, the, this role of paradox. Um, and then we worked backwards in search of sort of the initiating phenomena we chose a number of other elements that we knew were important in current social innovations through our synchronic research as agency, combination, recombination, pattern shifts, paradox. Uh, and we tried to chart these across some kind of a system very similar to the MLP scales of institutional landscape problem domain or niche innovation. And then when we, we it revealed interesting patterns where we would see uh, sort of critical shifts or changes in the pattern we would take a much deeper dive and go in historically to, to journals and, and letters and, uh, and archival research of that kind, kind of thing. So we ended up with, with uh, seven different cases, no, eight different cases, the internet, uh, the financial derivatives, the national park system, indigenous residential schools, one of our negative cases, Dutch East India Trading Company, the legalization of birth control for women, intelligent tests and another indigenous case, the duty to consult. And we did come up with some cross-cutting patterns and some signs of resilient social innovation. Not all of them had to do with paradox, so I'm not gonna go through them all, but you know, the book is available in your library, I would hope. And so, so I think you could look for it then. And it also has a more complete um, definition of how we, how we carried out this particular methodology. So, let me look now just at a couple of examples that have to do with the, uh, that have shed light on, on paradox. One of them is we were looking at these combinations and recombinations. We discovered that, you know, in fact, um, actors were engaging with it adjacent possible um, in order to maintain a, a momentum, but that that in fact introduced contradictions. So in the case of the legalization of birth control, it was born out of a notion um, that, you know, children should be conceived in love, born of mother's conscious desire, only begotten under conditions which render possible the heritage of health. Therefore, we hold that everyone must possess the power and freedom to prevent conception, except when these conditions can be satisfied. So it's very much attached to the notion of women's rights and women as equal to men. It went back, you know, uh, to the Enlightenment, actually, uh, 1789 to and enlightenment thinkers and early feminists fight for human rights and equal rights for women. And so at that point, you know, in those days, uh, contraception was largely market driven. In fact, you did have, um, you know, uh, industry and particularly with the discovery of rubber involved in this kind of contraception. But then there was a backlash against this. And in 1873, the Comstock Act made all contraception illegal. It was seen as fundamentally immoral. And then you began the, the fight against it. And that included, among other, many other people, Margaret Sanger is quite famous for sort of leading this and, 
um, and she wanted to make it a, a rights issue. But then you see a long period of time between 1910 or whatever up until about 1966, you know, and these where it was being legalized in Canada, it was being legalized a little early, but not much earlier in other places. And we saw an interesting pattern where the people who were pushing forward uh, the birth control, legalization of birth control issue would, would, would join, would create partnerships um, out of necessity with other issues. So during the outbreak of venereal disease in the First World War, um, doctors, um, you know, were objecting to the transmission of venereal disease. It was seen that condoms in particular could, could in fact protect against it. And so Margaret Sanger, Sanger said, well, we'll, you know, we'll just join forces with this notion. Um, it wasn't, it was very much not addressed to women's rights more venereal disease in men. But in fact, what it allowed for is that was a crack in the Comstock Act, so they began to distribute condoms and, and you know, she felt this was making some kinds of progress. Then during the Depression in 1930s, when, when people really couldn't get enough to eat, um, family plan became an anti-poverty issue. And again, you know, not, it's not where she was coming from, but she joined and the, the movement joined with with uh, the anti-poverty activists because in fact, they felt they could forward it. And then there was a growing, as there was a growing demand, the manufacturers again, began to, to take a, a, an interest in trying to be, to be able to produce uh, birth control. And, um, and they began to lobby heavily until finally uh, the ascendancy ruling was, was overturned through pressure from the industry in 1939. So you have, you know, the notion that, that uh, of disease and the prevention of disease, so the health-based issue, you have the poverty-based issue, and then you have the commerce-based issue. And interestingly enough, you can, you can see those issues surfacing again and again, even in the discussion of current technologies for reproduction and birth control, where people will argue on the basis of health or on the basis of equal rights or equity where you know poor people shouldn't have to should have more or being forced to have children who don't want to have children or around the fact that you know this should be market and demand driven and yet they never sit all that comfortably with that ideal notion of women's rights so so you begin to build in contradictions another one that's more ecological um is you know, the one of the national parks where you can really clearly see that as you begin to develop to hold up these contradictions, it, it produces paradoxes and tensions. So, you know, the national parks were first protected in 1864. There was a long line of artists and, and engineers and scientists who were behind this movement, which, you know, took place many, many years before. In fact, it was really institutionalized over, you know, a hundred years. Um, and yet from the beginning, uh, it was driven by a very romantic notion is in that quote there, God has saved, has cared for these trees, saved them from drought, disease, avalanches, and a thousand tempests and floods, but he cannot save them from fools. So the idea that nature, you know, is God's gift to the world and that, you know, there's something spiritual about, you know, our connection with nature. Um, but in fact, it was an uphill battle getting support and resources to move this forward. So at various times, the, the uh, environmentalists, you could call them that, or the romantics who were pushing for these parks to be preserved, you know, allied with, you know, threw their lot in with conservation scientists who were going out to do the Lewis and Clark type first expeditions to, to see what resources were there. The the expanding railroads who were interested in trying to create a tourist trade. Um, and, you know, they, they uh, partnered with those railroads to, 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 to push forward this idea of a, of a public park and, um, and with the scientists to sort of, you know, say, we're gonna map out these as resources, but, but inherent in that were these dilemmas. Is this, is this a wilderness or is it a park? Is it science and conservation science or is it tourism you know is it nature just should be left alone or is it culture something that that you know humans should should um, get engaged in and and those are enduring paradoxes and so if you sit we're sit at the boardroom of a uh, 
a national board of a national park, these same arguments are, are going on today, even in once this is established. And, you know, how much should we charge? Should we charge? Should we limit how many people go in? You know, should scientists be able to do research in here or not? Or should they, you know, should they, should it all be about protecting the animals in the hair and we should actually keep people out? And how do we balance these things? How do we, and it's been a great stimulus to a whole set of innovations around wildlife corridors that have been created around, around containment of, of hiking into certain kinds of regions, but it, it, it continues to be a stimulus for innovation. So we have many other examples of that, but, but what we saw over time was this, this pattern of combination and recombinations that built these tensions and contradictions that didn't seem to make sense um, intellectually, they didn't really hang together, but they hung together pragmatically. And so they came together and it did help to keep the movement alive, but it continues to, you know, create this uneasy um, tension. This is, you know, it's not a, a pure initiative in the way that many early innovators really want to keep their initiatives pure in this kind of way. So, you know, what, how could we use these kinds of insights in practice? Well, one was that you know, we, we, we were very interested in system mapping, but a lot of system mapping is really synchronic. You take a snapshot and this is, you know, this is the dynamics that are informing the system in one moment in time. So we were trying to create through these historical studies, something we call pattern maps. And uh, here's an example of a pattern map from the National Park System. And you're not gonna be able to read of all this, but what we did was we tried to you know, find this, uh, you know, these different scales, these broad cultural perceptions of nature, you know, industrialization, urbanization, wars, et cetera, things that are really going on at what we would call a landscape level. And then down at the lower levels where we have these circles which represent individual parks and, you know, individual people who are, who are involved in, in doing it and leading it forward in any moment in time. And of course, what you begin to see is that there's clusters, you, you, get, you get bursts of creation of park and then, and then periods of when nothing is happening and then another burst, a bigger burst, but then a long period of nothing happening. And so you could begin to say, well, you know, let's, let's, let's go down to those transition points and see what was going on, you know, that, that caused a shift from heavy activity to no activity, et cetera. And, and, you know, you're able to look across and begin to say, you know, what's going on in a larger, much larger complex domain you know, that allows us, in fact, to, um, to move an innovation forward or stops us from moving an innovation forward. You know, interestingly, from the point of view of the multi-level perspective, which we found obviously very useful, we found the least useful was the regime level. It just did not appear, it, it did not give as much information as the broader kind of landscape of what things are going on in the world. And then this activity at, at lower levels partly because of this odd combination recombination thing. So that, you know, the regime didn't stay constant. It, it, turned, it moved around, it became one thing, then it became another thing, it shifted in this kind of way. So that was an interesting theoretical ins um, insight. But we find that, you know, if we can, we can take initiatives that, that are initiatives today and we can track them back into, you know, the predecessors. As one of our social innovators, indigenous woman quite famously said, you know, it's, it, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a relay. It takes long periods of time and the baton keeps being passed along. And you, know, you can get absorbed by the urgency of doing something in this moment of time. But in fact, nothing that's really innovative ever unfolds in some very limited period of time. And so you have to see it in these longer sweeps of initiative. Um, and you can also come to understand how things that seem to you senseless and paradoxical have some sense. This this is another one we did with the legalization of birth control, but I, I won't go in that except to show you, you know, these critical, these, these different things meant critical transitions and agency acts and new ideas and moments of disruption, et cetera. We found this very useful way to see it and it became the basis of our, of our team's discussion and eventually of how we wrote up the cases. So the, the last one, the last tool, which is much more localized, but it begins at least this process of introducing time into, into social innovation is what we call the, the journey tool. And, and I'm gonna just put it all out here. Um, this actually drew initially from, a, uh, from an approach that was used by you know, the socio-technical, not 
the socio-technical transitions, but um, socio-technical redesign again, an initiative that you know was at its in its heyday in the in the sort of seventies and eighties. Um, and you know the idea was that you know if you wanted to understand what was going on with the system, what was working or not working, um, you know you need to look at the the whole throughput. And initially, again, this was developed around um, industry. So let's think of a car or an assembly line. It's going to go through, you know, introduce materials, you put together cars, you, you, you output as finished cars. But in fact, many of our human services are organized much like that as well. And this was a graphic that was created by a group of um, innovators who were trying to work around finding ways to address the problem of really troubled boys, you know, who who you know come into a system with problems and seem to come out you know in many many cases despite everybody's best effort as young offenders. So, using you know trying to understand why where's the problem. I mean the initial response is say well let's just try to give more services to these young offenders. But if you try to look at it from a larger multi scale system point of view, um, you can sort of you can do those frontline interviews the young offenders and what you're really looking for is this sort of index of coherence is like when when you're going through the system dealing with all these different people when do you feel pushed out of your comfort zone in in socio redesign they call those key variances in terms of your capacity to feel like you comprehend this is the index of coherence you can manage it uh, or you that, that you can control it in any kind of way um, and and they were quite able to locate you know some interactions were okay but these ones really weren't and and uh and so then when you you try to zero in on the ones that really don't work and what you discover of course is that the boy in question is interacting with an individual set of individuals often from a particular organization so it, it has a face it's a person and so you know they were they needed something or they were treated in a certain kind of way or they were rejected or they were helped you know they and so it either increased and intensified their confusion and angst, or it made them feel better. Uh, but when you looked at the ones that really increased their confusion and angst, and you talked to the individuals who are involved at that level, then you discovered that they actually are not operating freely or out of a necessarily strong, you know, value perspective, which is often what we think. Uh, you know, these these jerks, they just don't, you know, they don't understand, or they're immoral, or they're stupid or they're something else but they're actually at reacting out of an organizational context so it's a, a response that's constrained um and and what's it constrained by well it's constrained by the next level the the ministry which sets the policy and which tells them what they can do and what they can't do and if you go up to the ministry level you discover well of course those responses are constrained by a broader cultural beliefs the economy policies, the government, et cetera, at the, at the really broad institutional scale. So you say, well, well, what can you do about it? It's overwhelming, but not necessarily so, because then you can begin to locate, um, you know, the key interactional issues and begin to say, well, maybe it's not so much providing new services for those at the front line, but actually, say, trying to change a policy in the Ministry of Social Services or, or at a broader legal level that the Ministry of Social Services will reply to and that's this notion of system acupuncture where you know you can go in and 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 try to just press on one particular point um so again this kind of mapping just like the larger mapping begins to say well things that are intensely experienced as you know as paradoxes are making no sense of being inherently contradictory um often actually result from uh miss you know um, directives that are coming at different levels and constrain people differently in a way that is not transparent as you go down the system so people experience it as nonsensical and they experience it that way at every level so um, to try to overcome or to work with that paradox you begin to have to be able to pinpoint where the key disconnects are happening so we found that this also was very helpful uh, particularly for those social innovators who are working in any kind of services, um, because in fact, those do have a sort of a, it's not obviously as long as the bigger social innovation studies we were doing, but it, but it shows this progress through time. And again, 
you know, if I, I will, I will hand over this little handbook, and which show, gives you the steps of how you actually do this kind of process with it with practitioners. So just in conclusion, you know, we we really swam around in looking at paradox. We were surprised to find it so importantly there in the beginning when we began to study it. Um, but researching it helped us to understand why it's so common, in, particularly when you're dealing with social innovation in com very complex systems, um, the, the way in which um, you know, things are emergent. Uh, they do not necessarily uh, correspond to cause and effect. They're, they, they're inherently problematic because of the fact that we're all part of the systems we're trying to change. And then you, know, you have actual discrete paradoxes of of, of competing values through time where you know, systems tend to swing back and forth from one corner of the dilemma to the other with, in a restless way that doesn't really make for sustainable innovation. So we learned a lot about it. And then working with practitioners, I think helped them and us too, as we learned so much from them to move from a place where they often felt stuck you know, by just the enormity or the incomprehensibility or, or their, even their own emotions of, of anger or rage, which in many cases were very justifiable, to a place that was much more generative, um, from conflict to a sort of general relationship, and also you know, helping them to recognize that despite their, their understandable feeling of urgency, that it's a relay, it's not a sprint, it's going to take time. In many of our cases, the shortest 50 years, the longest close to 200. Um, it doesn't mean that important changes and things are not happening, uh, but that the whole process takes time. So I will stop this share just at the moment and um, say I've, it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Um, I hope you're enjoying this course. It sounds terrific. Wish you could be there in person as I guess we all do these days, <laughs> wishing we could be together. And uh, thanks for listening. Goodbye. <laughs>